Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this November 15th, 2016 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can listen to my show every weekday evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific Time. They also play the show at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, and if you can't get it there, go to my long-standing website at A-R-C-T-I-C-B-E-A-C-O-N.com, Arctic beacon.com and you can uh, get shows going back over a decade regarding the vatican led new world order all its tentacles and all of the ramifications of this organization on our domestic and foreign policy as well as as well as its ramifications on our freedom of religion i've talked about this many times and today i have bert krantz from the Alamo Ministry on, and Bert comes on my show regularly to talk about these issues which are vital uh, in America. Now, I've covered the Alamo Ministry story for better part of, I don't know, almost eight years, going on almost 10 years, I think. And I've seen uh, what's happened to these people. They have been persecuted in America for their views. Uh, they have talked the truth about the Vatican, just as I do on this show. And uh, they have been targeted by the FBI, the BATF, you name it, the IRS, and their pastor, who has been talking about the Vatican-led New World Order for a better part of 40 years, now sits in jail for 175 years. Uh, finally, uh, after covering this story and talking to many, many people, looking at the legal aspects of it, looking at the spiritual aspects, looking at how this ministry really reflects Christian persecution in this country. And it's not some a myth. It's not just happening in Africa. It's happening right here. But it's a little bit more subtle. And that's why I have Bert on to explain that. But let me go one step farther. We started a petition to free Tony Alamo. I've never seen a case where a man should be uh, that has been targeted like this, now sits in jail for, I believe, almost, I don't know, since 2008. And uh, he is 82 years old, blind, but is still upbeat and still uh, incredible with his message. I, I, and the ministry is still functioning. There's a lot of aspects to this story, but I think with the election of pres you know, President-elect Trump, and his commitment, at least on the surface, he says he wants to bring back religious freedom to Christians. He also wants to get rid of what the, is called the Johnson Bill. Uh, Lyndon Johnson passed a law which stated that if you want 501c3 money, you're not going to you're not going to support a candidate or talk politics on the pulpit. He wants to get rid of that. That's why Tony Alamo's in prison. And let's see what we can do to get this in front of Trump and his people. And Bert, with that, I want to bring you on the show. What are your thoughts now about the possibility, let's get right to the point, of having someone open his ears to what happened to Pastor Alamo and your ministry? Well, I really pray that that's the case. And uh, from the responses that we've had from going to his, we've gone to virtually every one of his events as he was campaigning. And from the responses that we had with them, I think it's very hopeful. We have talked to people that are close to him, and uh, they have given us very positive responses in uh, in our plight. And I, I, I really hope that he does live up to his campaign promises and that he is for the freedom of religion in the United States. You know, just uh, we're going to get back to that, but why don't we... Uh fill in people about what happened to you and really the reason behind it, what happened to your ministry, because there's still a lot of people out there that don't know about it because, you know, the Internet puts a muzzle on these kind of stories. So I try to get them out as much as I can. So just refresh our memory on exactly what happened to you. And you can go back as far as you'd like because you've been with them for 40 years. Well, I'll go all the way back, but I'll try and keep it brief and bring it up quick. Uh, ever since I have been involved with the ministry, ever since I was saved in 1972, the ministry has suffered persecution. And even before that, the uh, ministry started in Hollywood. It was actually started when uh, a bunch of hippies asked Tony and Sulamo to come and preach at their dope den. And they said that they would if they cleared out the drugs and they came in and they and all the hippies there were saved. Uh, it, there's a little story on how that happened, but they were saying that's they tried to bring the 
hippies to churches and the churches didn't want to bring hippies in and they ended up with a hippie church in Hollywood, California and they were going out into the streets and they were preaching the gospel, winning souls, they were winning uh, the, the drug pushers, they were winning uh, the harlots, they were winning the hippies, they were winning all kind of people out on the streets and it was bad for the business in Hollywood and so the uh, businesses on Sunset Boulevard, Hollywood Boulevard, they were really uh, wanted to persecute the church, and they, in cahoots with the West Hollywood Sheriff's Department, would uh, cause all kind of ruckuses at the church, and they'd actually come in, pour tear gas down into the prayer rooms, and as, as people were uh, coming out, they would be beating them with billy clubs, and then they would incite the neighbors to bring uh, accusations of, uh, you know, uh, disturbing the peace they 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 say that the church was disturbing the peace and that was like the uh, beginnings of persecution uh, and then uh, it would get into uh, um there was the cult awareness network back then when i first was saved which was a cia operation bent on doing away with the uh, christianity in the united states and they were kidnapping people out of churches, and there was uh, accusations brought by uh, state officials that would bring in state investigations. And all the while now, uh, Governor then, Ronald Reagan, sent his uh, one of his top uh, aides into the church to commend the church for the wonderful work they were doing on Hollywood Boulevard. Well, down through the years, uh, the Department of Labor came against the church, brought a suit against the church. We won that. And uh, So if I can interrupt for a second, uh, if Reagan uh, did that, what do you think was yes. the turning point then? What, what was going on behind the scenes? The turning point with Reagan? Yeah, if Reagan was uh, in your corner, so to speak, what happened? Where was the turning point where they really started to... I'm not sure to... where he turned, but I know that uh, shortly after he was elected, they, of course, uh, there was that attempted uh, assassination, and it seemed like he just jumped right in line after that. Now, that might just be coincidence, but uh, that's right about the time when he started. He opened up diplomatic relations with the Vatican. He got uh, together with the Pope to try and bring down the Soviet Union. So he started really working hard with the Vatican at that point. Yeah, good point. Go ahead. In fact, when he was president, uh, there was a, still a lot of these state uh, persecution, and Tony and Sue put in a plea to Ronald Reagan to see if he could help, and Ronald Reagan said, look, you can do more than I can. So that shows the kind of power that he had as a president. He couldn't, he, he was strictly uh, bound. He was very bound up as president, couldn't do probably maybe what his conscience wanted to do, but he, he did some very bad things yeah, as a president. Yeah, I agree sure, with of you. Course, now they make they lionize him, make him some big hero, but he, he really wasn't that great of a hero. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, the church is now experiencing more and more uh, pressure from the IRS, uh, etc. So the real breaking point. Greg is uh, after Susan Alamo died and this uh, um, Department of Labor judge in the case uh, tried to have her dragged into the courtroom Tony was very uh, distraught about that and he investigated into this and that's when he, it really came uh, to the forefront the involvement of the Vatican with our government and Tony really uh, he, after Susie died, he asked the Lord for the gift of a writing to be able to write. And that's when he really came forward with all the literature that he writes that's gone all over the world. This is in 1982. And when he started writing, the Lord moved him to write in, in exposing, uh, in not only preaching the gospel in the sense of, you know, oh, you must be saved, you must be born again, but to also tell the whole story of the, the uh, wickedness of this world and the the uh, rise of the beast and the rise of the one world government, the one world church, the uh, and the media, the mouth of the beast, and he began to expose this stuff. And in 1983, he wrote an an article entitled "The Pope's Secrets." Now that that article just went it went <laughs> for back then. They, they say now what it it 
went viral. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> back then there was no internet. We had a computer, but this went viral on paper all over the world by the millions. And uh, that really put a thorn into the side of the Vatican with Tony. And so, as you know, Greg, the Vatican has its tentacles in every single government in the world, and they really pressed upon the United States government to increase the persecution against the church. And from that time, uh, and, Antone, and Tony also would point this out and point out, like, say, for instance, he pointed out that uh, Ronald Reagan signed on to the Genocide Convention. He signed on to the, uh, you know, the diplomats in the Vatican the first time since the Civil War that uh, the United States recognized the Vatican. And of course, they, you know that they uh, stopped to recognize the Vatican back then because of their link to the Lincoln assassination. Exactly. And so uh, he, uh, he just was exposing the, these things and the persecution got greater and greater. And it's amazing because you see now in the, in the press to where uh, the media that's... Uh, like on the internet, the, the not so mainstream media is bringing out more corruption about the government, and they seem, and it seems to reach a breaking point where, well, where someone like Trump could even be elected because people uh, don't seem to be trusting the mainstream media like they used to, which is a good thing. That's a very good thing. So, uh, they began to persecute more and more and more, and uh, they, they brought those IRS charges against Tony in the 90s, and then uh, they put him in prison for uh, five, six years then, and he, he uh, kept preaching the gospel. The church still grew. And, uh, and we have to make the point that uh, when he was put in prison, they had actually raided your, I think it was a clothing store, and stole all of the books, uh, so he had no way to prove uh, his case, correct? That's correct. I, I, I probably was brushing over that way too fast because I, I was trying to get through. But uh, you're right. The, when they brought that case, they had been investigating our church, the IRS, since the mid-'70s, and they brought, that, uh, they brought those charges in the 90s. And so for all that time, they couldn't find a case. But then in 1991, they came to our property on Georgia Ridge, actually, where the central books were kept for the entire church. And they, they stormed that property and literally stole it. They kicked hundreds of people out of their houses in February of 1991. And at gunpoint, this, was, this would have been Waco if we'd have had weapons. This would have been Waco if we'd have had any guns, but there are never, have never, ever been any guns allowed in our church. We're not that kind of people. Uh, the Lord says that, you know, they that take the sword will die by the sword. And uh, our weapons are not, uh, uh, they're not carnal weapons. Our weapons are the Holy Spirit. So uh, we're a very peaceful people, very peace-loving people, and we, we are peacemakers. The Lord says, blessed are the peacemakers. But they did come on with these uh, uh, militarized uh, raid back in 1991, kicked all the people out, stole all the records to where the, and then when the IRS brought the charges against Tony for tax evasion and failure to file, uh, we are tax exempt, and uh, they had the books and then they accused Tony of hiding the books. So the whole case, as it was brought before the jury and before the judge in Memphis at the IRS court, they were presenting a case where this dishonest uh, charlatan was hiding his books and then uh, saying false things that he was helping people. And all the while, he was being enriched by this as if he was just a charlatan. And then come to find out late after, in a separate case after Tony was convicted, uh, it was brought out in depositions that they did have all the books. They knew they had all the books, and they were lying to the jury, and they were bringing a fall, whole entirely false case. So with this information, it was brought to Judge McCullough, the judge in the case, to plead to him to uh, vacate the sentence, let Tony out, and he, wouldn't, he didn't care. 
that be, and that really shows the bias or the uh, the goal, their real agenda was to do away with Tony Alamo and to, to get him out of their hair. Well, if work. I just hold it there, let me let's stick to the IRS for a second, just to make your point. Uh, as I investigated this case, uh, many people will say generally, oh, the IRS is used as a club to stop conservative views, to uh, basically uh, muzzle anyone, any church that doesn't fall in line with the Vatican's ecumenical movement. And uh, I wanted to prove that. So what I found out uh, was not only Tony was targeted, but Tupper Saucy, who said the same things about the Vatican, was targeted, and he was put in jail for bogus IRS charges. There was a ministry up in Oregon that uh, was also speaking out against the Vatican that was being harassed by the IRS. Uh, also a group that I knew about that uh, was uh, a small Christian church that uh, was run by the family members of Samuel Morris, who was the uh, inventor of the Morris Code and back in the 1800s spoke against the Vatican and warned us in a book he wrote that the enemy from within would be the beast the Vatican along with our government that will destroy this country. Their ministry was being targeted because of IRS, with the IRS. So there's a pattern. It's not just an isolated incident. So people, let's use this as a talking point. The IRS targets used, is used to target uh, by the government and the Vatican as their tax collector to, to silence people. I don't even think the IRS is necessary, and maybe Trump, who's always being audited, <laughs> will get rid of the IRS and say, hey, we just need some auditors here. Let's pare down the government. That would be a great step, wouldn't it? Well, the uh, money that is given to the IRS uh, mostly goes right to the Vatican. I think you know that. And yes, that would be a wonderful step because uh, we don't need those kind of bully boys, you know, uh, just punishing the American people and holding them down. The, uh, it's interesting you, you mentioned Samuel Morse because you know that he warned strongly against the Vatican and uh, he also warned about the dangers of uh, uncontrolled immigration because that the people coming in were mostly Catholic. <laughs> which, of course, is the same thing today. Of course, they're bringing in a lot of Muslims, but people coming up from south of the border are mostly Catholic, and they're going to vote the way that they're, they have no, uh, especially the illegals that are being allowed in, they have no uh, affiliation or no, no loyalty to our country. They're coming up, and they're going to vote for the people that are giving them the big handouts, and they're so they're voting in the, the Vatican. Right. The way that their priest tells them to vote. You know, and I, we should make it clear, too, and then we can move on with your story, that many people are confused in this country. When you say Christianity, they lump everything together. Protestants, ecumenical movement, uh, Vatican, uh, Catholics, born-again Christians, they're all lumped together. And there's some very distinct differences. For example... If you look closely, the Vatican is not Christ. It's not a uh, Catholicism is not Christianity, and much of Protestantism has been a lukewarm uh, group of people who have not uh, basically uh, fallen under the umbrella of the Pope, but in a subtle way. That's where you guys differ. So explain that to us, so people understand what Christianity really is. Well, one thing, you know, when I was growing up, it never was emphasized at all that the Catholic Church had anything to do with Christianity, that they were Christian. Christian, You never really heard that. But since the revival that happened, which really, uh, were the, they called it the Jesus Movement back in the late 60s, that Tony and Sue were at the forefront of, and there was this great revival throughout the land, and, and uh, evangelical Christianity got a real foothold in the United States, and now and then all of a sudden the Catholics got in on the act and became Christians. It, it, it's just, that's just an incidental thing. Or you hear them more described as Christians, and now you're right, everybody's a Christian. And it's such a, it's in the, the, the deal is such a mess now that a lot of people that are Christians don't even like to call themselves Christians because of all the atrocities that happen in the name of, of Christ, you know, in the name of Christianity, historically and in current events. So you're right, uh, it's very 
broadly used and everybody's a Christian. But, you know, Jesus said, uh, not all those that call me Lord, Lord, they're not going to enter into heaven. But those that do what my commandments, they're the ones that are going to come in. They're the ones. And so he says, strive to enter in at the straight and the narrow gate because many will, will enter in at the broad gate that leads to destruction. I like to call them Broadway Christians. <laughs> but uh, the very few will strive to enter in at the straight gate, and they'll be hated, they'll be despised, they'll be persecuted, they'll be dragged into courts, they'll be put into prisons. The Bible even says they'll be beheaded. So this is the, uh, this is the heritage of Christians to suffer. And, and uh, in the New Testament, Paul counted it glory and honor to suffer, to, to even suffer even a little bit in the name of Christ, in, you know, to, to share in his sufferings because they, he said they hated me and they will hate you and the reason they'll hate you is because they hate me and that's how it is today if Christ was to stand on this earth today in the flesh and to and to have a platform and preach his gospel they'd put him right on a cross today hmm. yeah, exactly so uh, yeah we got about three minutes so uh, here's what we can do continue on with where we left off so he gets out of uh, prison and I think that might have been a warning that first time that they put him in prison for the bogus IRS charges. And uh, basically, I've seen this as a pattern, too. They'll say, look, we'll slap your wrist here. You'll spend a few years in jail. If you decide to shut up, maybe we'll leave you guys alone. Maybe don't talk so much about the Vatican, Tony. Uh, it's not doing you any good. What was his attitude? Well, you know, I would say that that could be, except for I have some evidence that, that they were actually... They've been trying to just bury him from then because before they even brought that IRS charge, they threatened him. After they stole all our property on Georgia Ridge, Tony had a radio program and he rebuked that judge and said that judge was going to stand in a higher court. And they construed uh, Tony's radio programs that he was threatening a federal judge and they charged him with that. And when they first picked him up, they... They charged him with that, brought him into a trial on that. Now, if they had gotten him, convicted him of threatening the federal judge, that would have been it. He would have been in prison for life at that time. So as they were um, holding that trial, we had a, uh, Jeffrey Dickstein, the same attorney that, that uh, defended Tony in the IRS trial. He did a better job on this trial, and the Lord really moved because uh, the whole case that, that the uh, – state had against Tony was from his radio program, but they took 60 hours of radio programs and condensed them into about 10 minutes, and they took those little clips, the little sound bites, and made it sound very inflammatory. So the only defense was to play many hours of Tony's programs. So they played many hours of them to the jury, and I remember coming out of the court that day I was there, and the press comes to the our attorney and says, well, you know, I noticed that... Uh, Tony Alamo didn't say anything about that judge that he doesn't say about the president, about the pope, and, and about <laughs> a lot of other public officials. And then the lawyer says, well, well, I'm glad you noticed that. You know, He's an equal opportunity rebuker. You know? <laughs> he, uh, he definitely will tell uh, the, the story about anybody that's corrupting our government, that's corrupting uh, the society, and, and trying to drag people into a one-world government, which the Bible says is anti-Christ. So uh, that's why I say that they were really trying to bury Tony even then, but the IRS thing was the best they could do at the time. And they spent the rest of that time building up the case, uh, they were working on you know, putting together something that they could uh, just do away with them, because they, they really thought the church would Bert? break up at... Yeah, we'll, we'll pick that up. we got to take a break real quick here. i got to cut you off. Uh, back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment rights media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. 
If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal on this uh, November 15th, 2016 day. On our calendar, my guest is Bert Krantz, a longtime member of the Alamo ministry. We're recapping the whole story of how this ministry, this Christian ministry, has been persecuted. Its pastor been put into jail for 175 years for crimes he didn't commit. And uh, I, before we get back to the story, I wanted to mention this, that if you go to freetonyalamo.com, you can get, uh, you can read about the petition that uh, I've started, and there's another website you go to to sign up. Do that, and let me tell you my what we're planning to do. Uh, since President-elect Trump has uh, garnered probably the ec the ecumenical vote uh, as well as the Catholic vote at a higher uh, percentage than any president uh, elect in modern times. He has stressed freedom of religion. He has stressed the fact that he would like pastors to speak out on the pulpit. And so we're going to present this petition to him once he gets into office and he gets settled in and uh, to his a group of people that uh, we should look at this case. And if there is freedom of religion in this country, if he wants pastors to speak out, then he should free Tony Alamo and pardon him. And I'm going to go one step farther. I want to watch what happens to the Clintons. And if for any reason she is not held accountable and pardoned by either Obama or uh, Trump, there is a there's a big problem here because I'll tell you what, uh, Tony deserves another chance to get out because he's been there too long for things he hasn't done. And I think we have a chance, a small window here with President-elect uh, Trump uh, that we would have never had with the Clinton cartel. Now, 
this came to mind right now, Bert. Clintons were very instrumental in attacking you guys because you guys had a ministry in Arkansas. This is where it finally happened in 2008. But long before that, uh, I know Tony knew Clinton, but they were at odds. And I think he was on one of uh, he was on Clinton's hit list as well, don't you? Oh yes, oh yes, he was. Uh, in fact, Clinton, uh, when he wrote his memoirs, he wrote three pages about Tony in there. Not too flattering either. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Go ahead, explain. Oh yeah, Bill Clinton did. Uh, so he, he he just called him some bad names and and gave a very uh, negative account. Well, Tony Alamo. So, uh, but Tony Alamo, he never really uh, came against Clinton or anything like that. In fact, early on, Clinton, when uh, he looked at Tony as a uh, voter base, uh, also, and 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 he was uh, friendly towards Tony. He gave him uh, a fire department uh or for when tony tony the town came to tony asking him to ask for a fire truck in a in a building you know for a fire house and he complied with that he told tony that he could have built uh, a theme park on uh highway 71 there in in arkansas but uh tony never did that but um so he was courting then, tony for votes maybe right courting Tony for votes at that time and but then uh, when Waco happened Bill Clinton uh, of course the Clinton administration was was the war room to take care of that and uh, and Hillary was the one that put the orders out through Web Hubble and those you know the story on that and they massacred those people in Waco and then Bill comes out and uh, proudly accepts responsibility for it and says and we have other uh cults he called them uh and i've had to confront them in here in arkansas now obviously uh, he was talking about our church and he's saying maybe this will be a warning for people to stay away from things like that you know Mm -hmm. it it was like intimidating people and scaring them from going to our church so uh what was tony's reaction you know tony did uh, point out just the way, pretty much the way I just did, and and did print that and and spread that around. And uh, I think I don't know if you've read much of what Tony said about Waco, but oh yeah, Tony told the told the true story on Waco right from day one. Right. Right from day one. In fact, Susan Alamo back way back when uh, uh, Jonestown happened, they were telling the true story on Jonestown from day one. That was no no. They didn't. You don't get that many people to take. Uh, cyanide and commit suicide because you say so they went in they shot all the people they were those people were killed and they and the whole thing was done in order to give weight to give leverage to the kind of persecution they were bringing against churches in the united states that didn't look mainstream that didn't go along with the uh the cookie cutter mold of what the catholic church says a christian should be that's exactly what that's all about. Same thing with Sun Moon, all these different people that they brought in, even Manson. I mean, all those different uh, oddball and, and uh, violent people that were lifted up before the people and then it called cults, then that was just to, to bring a black eye upon true Christianity or any uh, anyone that didn't go along with the Vatican. And it's very successful. It's very successful look where it is today the churches went along with that i was mentioning it to you during the break uh, the, uh, the churches went along and then when persecution would come for these uh, against these uh, churches that were called cults like for instance the branch davidians or these uh, mormon people in uh, texas no christians want to stand up no christians want to stand up and defend these people because they don't believe the way i do and so that gives more leverage to the state to just walk in and just trample over any church that doesn't go along with the Vatican or the government. The, the government is supposed to decide who's a Christian and who's not. Which judge do you trust to do that? Which president? Which which one of the candidates today would you trust to say that your religion was right or wrong? Mm-hmm. You know, I I know I I I did support Trump 
but I, I, there's no way he never really claimed to be a, a Christian. I don't think he really did. Well, he might have said something about being a Christian, but it would be the kind of Christian you're talking about. You know, he's definitely as a sinner, and that, and that was pretty much brought out before the whole United States. And he was humbled, and he and he he came humbly before the the uh, nation and said, "Look, I never said I was perfect. I've been humbled." And he said he came out and said, "I've been very humbled by this experience of running for president." And his, it's like his whole life was laid out before the world. Yeah, well, a whole other subject. Right, a whole, we'll get into that. And and that just reminds me of two things. Uh, if you want to get more on Waco and what Tony said about it, go to alamoministries.com, and you can get some really great articles going way back, and you can listen to him uh, tell us things we're talking about today. And I remember when I first met him, I, I was searching out people who understood what the Vatican was like in this country, and there are few and far between. And it's not an easy task to get this message out. Uh, going through the mainstream, we know uh, that you're not going to get much on it. But I think there's a there's a window here that people have to understand. And uh, like I said, we have to start out, look for uh, some of the good things that can be done with this change of administration, but then not lose sight of the real overview of what the New World Order really is. And I think if we take that perspective... Uh, we're not just going to sit back and lose hope. we got to move forward. And uh, I believe that's important to put together the spiritual and the political and to work for the good of everything. And I, I don't know. You know, there's not many pastors that do that. They just stick into their little, you know, their happy little uh, church and talk about the Bible. But they never relate it to, pers to modern day events. And I think that's such a mistake because the, as Tony said, and as we said at the break, it could be the churches, the Protestant churches and the pastors who have failed this country. Your thoughts on that? Well, you know, the First Amendment guarantees the free exercise of religion. Not that you can go into some little meeting place and go inside there and then do what you do. Do your little thing in there and then come out and just, you know, be like a mouse and not say anything to anybody and not rock any boat, not, uh, you know, but uh, that's not the exercise of religion. The exercise of religion is bringing the gospel to every creature and to bring the gospel is the whole word of God. Now, the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, these are part of the word of God and they speak of a very powerful world government. They speak of the beast. They speak of the mouth of the beast, the, the media, that is going to speak great swelling words, uh, blasphemous, by the way, against God. And uh, one thing that did come out in, uh, in the course of this electoral process, and it's been building up, uh, you saw the, the Pope actually, he must have been worried for some reason because he actually came out and, and started endorsing Clinton and, and saying, don't vote for this guy Trump. Of course, you know, they do reverse psychology also. So, uh, but, but the people did see the Pope stepping in and, and becoming a political platform in the United States. What's the Pope got to do with who gets elected president of the United States? Well, quite a bit, um, <laughs> evidently. And, and it's been manifest during this electoral process. Right. Why don't we go back again? So we're talking, we left off where Tony's now out of prison for the IRS uh, bogus charges. And how did you guys move forward then after the, uh, the incident with the judge uh, was settled and there were no charges brought or he, uh, he was not found guilty? How did you guys move forward then? That's, that's a great question, Greg. It was actually a, a very faith-building process. I'll have, I have to tell you that because, as you know, they stole every one of our properties. We had no property. People ran off and they went where they could. They, I mean... Well, I didn't realize that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. When they, took, when they stole our property at Georgia Ridge, they stole all of our property in Arkansas, all of our property in Nashville, and uh, the property in Los Angeles... The people went away from that property for a while because, you know, they they didn't want the, the armed people coming up and threatening them and their children. And what the what the uh, government did at that time, they went up there and they cut off all the electricity. They boarded up the buildings and they condemned them. 
And so they made it to look, you know, in the, the congregation, when they came back, they didn't know what to do. And then here, Tony was in prison. Well, when Tony got out, he said, look, let's just go up and get our property back <laughs> up there in Los Angeles. This is uh, this is that property in... Uh, Canyon country, country, right? Yeah, the, well, the place was all worse. So we went up there and we reclaimed the property. We'll come to find out they didn't just cut the electricity off. They cut about 200 yards of wire that was, you know, the real thick wire that comes from the power pole mm -hmm. down into the property. And that's a lot of money <laughs> right there. We, we couldn't have, they had stolen everything. We were just a bunch of people just trying to survive. And here we came up and... Uh, we took the boards off the windows, fixed where they, uh, every, they'd been vandalized very badly, and, and uh, we fixed all the broken glass and did all the repairs in the building, and then uh, we couldn't get them to turn our power on because they said, oh, no, no, no. And uh, so we got a generator for about a year. We ran that church off a generator. And wow. Eventually, we did get our power, and now we're back, you know, we're back there. And how did you get all the, you recouped a lot of properties that got new, but how did you guys make it uh, from that Hard point? Hard work, on? Greg. We're not a church that goes out and uh, begs for money. We never have. From down through the years, we went, you know, back in the early 70s, it was a bunch of hippies coming off the streets. And for a couple of years, so three or four years, there, Tony and Sue supported the church. I And don't ask me how, because all they had was wall-to-wall -wall people and no money. But uh, it was the Lord. The Lord provided. But then when we, we didn't, we never did go out and solicit funds on our pro TV programs. We went out into the fields. We hold cotton. We picked olives. We, we worked in, in uh, field work, and, and we bought properties, and you know, people got married and had families, and the church grew that way. And then when we when we came back uh, after, you know, the church was regrouped into the Arkansas area after that uh, horrible theft of our property and the dispersion of the church by at gunpoint. So uh, people did have better skills. We were older, and we we did you know know how to uh, to work a little better than when we were hippies. <laughs> But uh, we just gathered, pulled our pennies together, and we bought property, and we, and you know, uh, and we prospered there for for a while. But all the while, the, the government saw us prospering, and and just worked and worked and worked to find some kind of a case against Tony Alamo to bring him down. So they and, take it all away, then you build it back up, and here we are again, now faced with uh, what's going to happen in 2008, right? Right, and you know all of this is a uh, it's a process in the in terms of uh, uh, you know the Lord says that, uh, I always go back to the parable of the sower. Now, of course, the the seed that falls by the wayside that's just your wicked heart that uh, you know they don't even want to hear the gospel. They never will. They're not going to ever receive Christ. It's just you know the gospel is dead to them. Then, but you got the people on the shallow earth, and you know most of this most of Christianity today is very shallow earth and when tribulation and persecution arises they're offended and they wither away and they don't bring forth any fruit now the the different uh persecutions that have come against our church have worked in that way to to weed out people like that you know the bible talks about wheat growing up with the tares tares growing up with the wheat and the lord says don't you worry about that you don't have to go in and try and pull the tares out i'll take care of that We'll see when this kind of persecution arises. Well, people that are more concerned about having a piece of property or a big bank account or, you know, uh, many different things in this world, they're not going to want to stick through this kind of stuff. They're going to go off and they're going to, you know, get a little job and get a little house and just forget it. I'm, and a lot of people did that, Greg. A lot of people did that. So... Uh, there's a lot of people that didn't also and, okay and those people uh, those people's testimony became stronger you see they say uh, you think you know however bad we talked about this on your program also before however bad i think that it's happened to me i can always find somebody out there that's got a worse deal than i did there's plenty of people out there that are worse off than me and uh, when, when, but when I go out and preach the gospel to them, if I haven't been in, been through any kind of this fire, and they have very, very bad problems in their life, and I say, well, I understand this. Say, no, you don't. You don't have a clue. But see, now I, 
I do. I do have a clue about a lot of different uh, aspects of problems that people can run into because the Lord has brought me through many, many problems. And I really, he's brought us all through them, and he's brought Tony through them, and he's taking care of Tony. And Tony being in prison is in a lot better position than those judges that took my children away. Yeah, and that's an aspect of what happened in two. So finally, in two thousand and eight, uh, we've done many shows about the raid in Arkansas, and uh, pick it up there. And we got about seven minutes, so let's see if we can get through this. Well, of course, they went out and they hunted down backsliders, and and this is a a big tool of Satan, and it's it's something how it took the it took the government a long time to really catch on to this that the the strength of the testimony of backsliders that they could use to smear the church and that's what they did they they took these people that had fallen away from the lord and they brought them to this cult awareness network center where they could brain dirty them into becoming their choir that would sing in four-part harmony in front of a jury and bring false accusations and slander against Tony. And they they came and they, the first time they came, they raided the property in Falk and they uh, stormed the pastorage and they stormed uh, several of the different office buildings and they just raked through those places looking, they said, for pornography. Well, you would think if there was any pornography going on, they could have came up with a picture or something, you know, a file of something. But they didn't come up with anything, nothing, zero. And uh, also, they say down through the years how we're armed and dangerous. They didn't, they didn't come up with a pop gun, Greg. When they went on, on either time they ever came stormed our property, any time they've ever done that, they'd never come up with even a jackknife. Mm-hmm. And so, so uh, we're not an armed and dangerous people. Never have been. But what they did do is they brought that charge. They, oh, at that raid, they stole, um, what, five or six girls that were playing in the playground. And they, they brought in their automatic weapons, like Uzi-type weapons with laser point, you know, the little laser points. And they had them aimed at these little girls' hearts. And if a pin had dropped, someone would have been killed. There would have been a slaughter there. But thank God no one was killed. No one was hurt during that raid, but they, they did steal those children, took them to the state, and they uh, they put them through all kinds of different therapy, and, and then they brought this charge against Tony, the Man Act. You've gone through the Man Act many times, and you know what a bogus charge that is in this day and age, and, and, and to bring against a pastor. Right. And the, so, uh, but the reason they brought the Man Act is because they could present a case without evidence, without real evidence. They, it was all done with personal testimony. And these these girls that they had trained, these women actually that they had trained, they brought them into the courtroom and and actually guided them through their testimonies right in the courtroom hand signals. Uh, I mean, it was just incredible. Yeah, and I've commented uh, many times. Uh, you can go back to a lot of my shows about the nuts and the the real nuts and bolts of this trial and how it was so. I call it worse than a kangaroo court. Uh, got about three minutes, Bert. Uh, we're going to come back to you in a week or so because I want to finish this up. But one of the things I've seen now is you guys built it up. They took it away again. Then they they not only put Tony in on phony charges, put him in prison. They took away most uh, over 30 or 40 children that still haven't been returned to their parents without sexual abuse or abuse of child abuse ever found. And they're in the process of taking away all of your property again. Now, here's the thing I want to emphasize. If you don't think this is a big story, folks, and you don't think we can get this in front of Trump, you better think twice. Because the case against the civil case that was filed to take away the property of Tony Alamo and the people and Bert and all the people that worked for it was the largest set was the largest case in the history of uh, settlement where you guys were found to be five hundred million dollars or something is the largest civil settlement in Arkansas history. 
This is the travesty of justice. It should be able to get in front a pretty high level of people, don't you think? It really should, Greg. And it's interesting when you say that because uh, that a judge would bring a judgment of $500 million against our church after, uh, say, from 1991, when they stole every bit, probably 50 to $100 million worth of property they stole from us, which was the entire assets of the church. And this ragtag group of people comes back together and, and builds up a $500 million. Uh, <laughs> come on. You think it worth that kind of money? Right. It's the largest set. It's the largest settlement in, in Arkansas history. Let's get this in front of some people. This is a travesty of justice it's in every travesty. avenue, in criminal avenue, and taking away children, in civil case. I mean, this is incredible. And let's say one thing before we close here, and we got about a minute and a half, about a minute. It's all because. Tony had the courage to not only spread the gospel in a lukewarm manner, but to talk about who the beast really is, the Vatican. Correct? That's correct. And that we are at the end of time, people. We're at the end of time. The signs are here. The one world government is not something in the future. You know, the, the Lord, uh, I pray to God that he gave us a little space of time here in America, but um, anyone can see just from her platform that Hillary Clinton was wanted a global government, you know. So I, uh, I'm glad. I really appreciate. Yeah, we got a little window of time, as I say now, and I appreciate that, and I thank God for that, don't you? Amen, I really do. I've, I've really felt a sigh of relief that no matter how bad Trump might turn out to be, it can't be as bad as if Hillary Clinton had been elected president. Good way to end the show, Bert. Thanks a lot. We're all out of time, and I'll see you again. Have a good evening. All right. Thanks, Greg, for having me. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, the rapture will be canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org.